the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me to your talk here. It's really an honor. Um, so I'm okay. I'm going to talk about contextuality in Beyond, and Beyond is natural language data, and it's really nice to be able to present work of um, this group of people. We've been working together for a while now. So you saw Daphne giving a talk in QMBC last year. Um, and then meanwhile, I've got another PhD student on this topic, Ian Lokane, also another very talented student. And then um, we've also been working with Shane Mansfield, who probably most of you know from Quandela. And Shane is co-supervising uh, Ian. Okay, so... Um, you know, natural language is quite ambiguous. And when I um, started to work on natural language, I always thought ambiguities are quite accidental. Uh, but time after time, um, you realize, in fact, there are systematic ambiguities in natural language. And what is uh, abnormal is how people understand each other in the presence of all these ambiguities at different level of syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Recently, a friend came and sent to me this phrase. Um, linguists love ambiguity more than most people, which is very true, and it's an ambiguous phrase itself. So, so in fact, this talk is also about how we can talk about quantum contextuality and ambiguities present in natural language. And so I wanted to give you an overview uh, of different forms of ambiguity. We've got syntactic ambiguity. And if you look at syntactic ambiguity within sentences, so this refers to different grammatical rules that words and further on phrases can have. Uh, so this is a problem that shows itself in parsing, for example. So here, take your like the most innocent noun that you can think of, like table. Uh, in fact, it's, it also has a verb role, uh, like a table emotion, other than its noun role. Chair, another very innocent noun, um, is not just the thing that I sit on. I can chair a session, like as the word is doing now. And then, of course, I've got most um, other words that are more well known for having different nouns, and that's cook, uh, as a cook, or the verb to cook, book as a book, or the verb to book. You've got words like complex, old, young, beautiful, that have. Uh, adjective and noun meanings, and so on and so forth. So these are difficult for parsers to determine when you're parsing a, a text. You, it's hard when you see table, you can't, you can't for sure say that it's a noun or a verb. But on the, uh, uh, furthermore, there are um, structural ambiguities as well. Like for example, here it's not very clear if the adjective old, well, suppose we decided that old is the adjective and not the noun. It's not very clear if all these uh, modifying men or both men and women. So that's, that's called a distributional ambiguity. Are we talking about old men and any woman or old men and old women? So this phrase is ambiguous. Um, what about he spoke about a friend with a smile? Who is having a smile? Is, is it the subject who is talking about his friend having a smile on his face or is the friend who has a smile? That's not clear. Another example is show me the meals on the flight from San Francisco. Do I want you to show me the meals that are served on the flight from San Francisco, the meals that are locally sourced in San Francisco, or I want you to show me the meals that we are going to serve on our wedding while flying from San Francisco. And then finally, I've got this other funny example which is easy for human beings, but not so easy for computers. We saw Eiffel Tower flying to Paris. It's not clear now here who is flying. Is it the Eiffel Tower or is it us seeing the Eiffel Tower? So there are many, many uh, ambiguities like this, which put parsers into traps. Now, if you go beyond sentences and you move to the level of discourse and you talk about a paragraph, a piece of text, a full document, then you also hit discourse ambiguities. And oops, sorry, I forgot to do full screen. Let me do full screen. So these discourse ambiguities are when uh, between sentences, we use markers such as pronouns, 
ellipsis markers, so on and so forth, to refer to words that are not in the same sentence. They are there before or after. A famous example is anaphora. Here you see the man hugged the boy. Then you have he was tired, he was crying, he was relieved. In none of these sentences is clear what is he referring to, who is tired, who is crying, who is relieved. Is it the man or the boy? Both can be the case. In some cases, feature agreement between pronoun and the referent can help you disambiguate, but as you can see here, that is not the case in this example. A very uh, canonical example of this kind of ambiguity is that the following, I put the CD in the computer and it broke. Now, which, which one broke, the CD or the computer? More complicated types are Filippo likes her dad and so does Ada. Who does Ada like? Filippo's dad or her own dad? So these are kind of semantic ambiguities. Then uh, you also got ambiguities at the level of semantics, which I'll talk in more detail about in the next few slides. And these are about meanings of words and phrases. So uh, you've got the word like spring, uh, which can refer to the season that just started last Sunday. It can refer to the metal coin. It can refer to a small river or the act of jumping. Um, so that's a very different kind of ambiguity than the ambiguity present in the word green, which can be the color green or uh, an environmentally friendly attitude, right? And if you see something like green spring, you're not sure if I'm talking about the spring which has many green leaves in it or a metal coil that is recyclable. And so, um, this is what we started to work on with Daphne. Can we say something about semantic ambiguities using quantum contextuality? Now I'll try to formalize this a little bit. So words or more formally canonical forms of words, which linguists refer to as lemos, they can have multiple meanings. So you've got mouse, which can be any of numerous small rodents or a hand operated device, the computer mouse. Now words are polysemous and you've got two different kinds of polysemy here, structured polysemy, where word senses are related to each other in some way. For example, the mouse in the computer comes in some way from the meaning of the rodent mouse, right? Whereas the spring meaning, the meanings aren't connected to each other. Or you can have sense ambiguities with no relation between them. And this is known as polysemy. Structured polysemy is sometimes also referred to as homonymy. Now, if you look um, often in lexicographic tradition, senses of words are uh, represented by enumerating. Um, so you just, you have the word mouse, you put mouse in bold and you say mouse one is the first sense of the word mouse. Mouse two is the second sense of the word mouse. Bank one is the first sense of the word mouse. Bank two is the second sense of the word now. It gives you the impression that these things are beautifully formalized within the lexicographs, which is absolutely not the case. In fact, it turns out what you see in dictionaries are often, um, they are not the uh, formal definitions of the senses. They are what the linguists call glosses. The glosses are not formal representations of meaning. They're just circular definitions that can still be used by human beings, but they're not formal representations of meaning. For example, if you look in a dictionary for the meaning of right, you might see something like located near the right hand side of the body, that's circular. If you look for left, you'll see located nearer to the other side of the body than the right. That's not really defining it. For red, you see the color of blood. For blood, you see the red liquid that circulates in the heart and arteries, and so on and so forth. So these glosses aren't formal uh, meanings. The dictionaries that we use widely don't actually give us the senses of the words. And this has made uh, computational linguists to put their efforts together. And recently, they are online databases of senses for example, WordNet. And if you look in WordNet, then you will see different senses of a word listed. And these are um, extending. So you see bass here has seven meanings, but if I look next year, there might be a couple more meanings that are added to it. And in WordNet, these meanings are enumerated in a special way based on the most frequent meaning to the least frequent meaning 
And in front of each meaning, as you see, bass one, you see exactly the definition of it, the lowest part of the musical range. Bass two, the lowest part in polyphonic music. You know, bass three, the adult male singer. And so on and so forth. And so as you can imagine, words and this ambiguation is a major task for computational linguistics. And a word sense this ambiguation algorithm, it takes a word in a context. So I'm very happy now we see the word context here. A fixed dictionary of word senses such as WordNet. And it, as an output, it will give you the correct sense which it chose from this dictionary of sentence given your word in context. Now, often only a certain number of words within the context need this ambiguation but it's easier if these algorithms are run on all the words in the context. And you can imagine how difficult it can be. And a strong baseline is the most frequent sense. For example, if you come across the word fruit, a human being would probably not even think about the other meaning. So the most frequent meaning of fruit is ripe and reproductive body of a seed plant, right? Rather than the consequence of an action. And in fact, the first meaning in word sense, in word net is the most frequent sense. And if your algorithm doesn't do anything but just picking the first meaning in word sense, the most frequent meaning, then you have a good chance that you chose the right meaning. So this is the baseline that you have to beat. Um, what has come to be popular these days in the presence of very successful machine learning algorithms is something that's called contextual embeddings, which will show up in our work uh, later. And it would be, I think it would be very nice if you found a formal connection. Uh, and these contextual embeddings are used in words as this ambiguation as follows. So you run a nearest neighbor machine learning algorithm. It doesn't have to be anything sophisticated. You can work with any cost function. It doesn't have to be a neural network or a deep neural network. But recently, if you choose a neural network algorithm, it will work better. You run it on a labeled corpus of words and their senses. So this, is, this has to be hand annotated by experts. And then learn an embedding, a vector of features, a vector of abstract features for each sense. By averaging the embeddings, so you separately learn contextual embeddings for each word, by averaging the embeddings of the words that have that sense in your sense annotated corpus. So he, this gives you a sense vector, a sense contextual embedding. And then at test time, given a word in context, you compute this contextual embedding and find out which sense vector it's closest to, for example, using the cosine distance. That's how you disambiguate. So this is the most successful algorithm these days. It has a lot of problems, uh, the most, Important one is that this is a supervised learning algorithm and labor in corpora with senses is hard and extremely costly. There are unsupervised algorithms. They have quite very low accuracies. You can automatically discover senses of words, you know, without having a dictionary, but these senses are quite abstract and very unfamiliar to the human mind. And furthermore, although, most of the successful word census ambiguation algorithms use contextual embeddings these days. The role of context is very implicit. The context of a word is its neighboring words, right? So that's all we know. Uh, it's used to build an embedding for it using a machine learning algorithm. Other than that, contextuality is not defined or in any way quantified. I cannot say if a word is more contextual than the other, I cannot even ask if a word is not contextual or maybe some words are not ambiguous, but are they contextual? Are all ambiguous words contextual? How contextual are they? Does it make a difference in comprehension of a test if it's full of ambiguous or contextual words and so on and so forth. So these were the research questions I posed to Daphne when she was doing her PhD. So, um, so we, we ask, how does the context influence the process of meaning selection? And uh, it's, then it becomes quite natural to use a setting uh, like CVD because the ambiguous phrases of a language give rise to probability distributions that are mined from the meaning of that phrase in different contexts. And uh, the context then obviously plays a non-trivial role in meaning selection. So we wanted to see how non-trivial that role is. 
And then we hypothesize and later prove by finding examples that given a certain interpretation of words within context, it would be most interesting if we would not be able to use this information to deduce how the same world is interpreted in another context. And that's the definition of contextuality in CBD, if I'm, if I'm correct. And so we came across the CBD literature. Actually, I'm lying here because uh, I saw Ehtibar giving a talk in a workshop uh, we organized in honor of Samson a couple of years ago, and that's where I heard about CBD. And then we started examining contextuality of natural language using the shift theoretic model, ran to the no signaling problem, and Samson suggested we look at CBD. So obviously there is the work of uh, Ehtibar and Kujala, uh, contextuality, context, content systems of random variables, and also subsequent work with uh, Cervantes, Victor, and many other people. It was really nice. I was familiar with the work of Busumaya from before, but never made the connections to Subi, the answering questions in behavioral sciences. And I was also familiar with the work of Brusa concept combinations in psychology, but never made the connection to CBD. But these are all obviously very closely connected. So this is uh, what we did to find out if we, if we have any interest in terms of contextuality in meaning ambiguity. So we formed uh, two word polysemous phrases, sort of rank two cyclic systems of CBD of the following form, subject verb, verb object, where both subject and object are polysemous, they can have different types of polysemy, structured polysemy or normal polysemy. And it was really interesting to find out that these subjects and objects, noun phrases and the verbs, the ambiguous nouns and verbs can be mined from psycholinguistic experiments. And there's lots of data sets out there, but nobody ever tried to put them together. I guess the complexity are beyond the equipments of psycholinguists. So what we did is we mined a lot of ambiguous nouns, a lot of ambiguous verbs, and try to find out which combinations for the same noun and verb make sense in the following four mentions, subject, verb, and verb object, right? And these are our most famous examples that turned out to be contextual later as well. So boxer adopts, adopts boxer. So probably you've seen Daphne talking about this. A boxer can be a fighter, a fist fighter, or a type of dog. Uh, you can adopt legally a child, uh, or you can uh, adopt a posture. So figurative or uh, uh, literal meaning of adopt. So this is like structured polysomy here for adopt, but normal polysomy for boxer. In the same way, you can also talk about adopt boxer, right? Uh, with, with all four different combinations. So that's boxer adopt in subject verb or verb object formation. And the other example which turned out to be contextual was pitcher true. A pitcher can be a baseball player or a jog and throwing can be the literal act of throwing something in the air like a ball or um, figuratively throwing something like a party or a shadow. And again, both pitcher true and true throwing a pitcher makes sense. Um, so also the uh, CBD literature, uh, the terminology there fitted itself really well to what we wanted to do. So a content QI in a context J gives rise to a random variable RJI, which are joint probabilities recorded in context, context tables as follows. So I won't explain this, but uh, let me see. And here, a content is a measurement, but thank, thank goodness it was, this can also be interpreted as, in general, the question you ask about your system. This question has a known answer, and anything extra, any extra information about the question, for example, historically, people think about the order of the set of questions that you ask, that is context. Anything else can be interpreted as context, any extra information. And then you sit down, as you know, you calculate your quantity delta, you calculate S odd, and you see if S odd is bigger than N minus two plus delta for us, N is two in half of our experiments. Later, we also consider rank four examples. And so for the rank two examples, it suffices to check if S odd is bigger than delta, strictly bigger than delta. So this is, this is what we calculated. So a content or a question for us 
is what we want to find out, what the word, the meaning of the word in this phrase. Anything beyond the word is the context. Uh, it can be the rest of the phrase, the sentence in which the phrase occurred, sentences around that sentence, the whole text. And in fact, we came across uh, descriptions that would normally go with images. For example, the artwork containing the image of an ancient pitcher throwing a black shadow on a wooden surface caught the attention of many internet buyers. And this is the normal textual context, but it also comes with an image of this job throwing a shadow. And the, this image is also part of the context. Anything you use to determine the meaning of the words. Okay, then it was really uh, pleasant to sort of sit down, we labeled the senses, the toss meaning, the casting the shadow meaning, for the pitcher, the jog meaning, the baseball player meaning. And then we, um, Daphne and I ourselves looked into two corpora by searching and looking around and filled in these probability tables. Then, um, for example, here for pitcher throw, we found that delta is 13 over 15, S over this 9 over 5 clearly bigger than 13 over 15. So that was one of our contextual examples. Uh, so let me tell you a bit about the data set. So this data set had 90 elements, 90 ambiguous phrases. The meanings we extracted by just searching the British National Corpus has a very nice online interface and UK VAC, which is the selection of all uh, Wikipedia articles in English and a crawl of all UK web domains in English again. So we search for the phrase in this corpora and then try to decide what do the ambiguous words mean. Uh, so we had the division of labor between Daphne and I. So these two examples are presented at the boxer and through a picture, but the only two contextual examples we found. Uh, quite, it was quite nice, but we weren't satisfied. So later we decided to sort of work systematically. So we put together a large uh, data set of ambiguous nouns, anything that we could find in circle linguistic research and ambiguous verbs, try to match all the ambiguous nouns, to all the ambiguous verbs in subject verb and verb object formations, and then pick the top 200, the top two, the 200 that made the most sense. Then from this, we chose 32 as pivot. And uh, th then we thought instead of looking for this in corpora, it, couldn't, it, it can't be done automatically so easily. So we thought we can put it on Amazon Torque and obtain annotations from human beings. So this part of the research is new, hasn't been published yet. Uh, before putting this on Amazon Torque, we thought um, maybe we should check some parameters like how many phrases can humans deal with efficiently? 32 at the time, maybe too much. How much time do they need? Um, are these 32 phrases too difficult, too easy, so on and so forth. So we first asked a few hand selected humans, like we asked colleagues, uh, boyfriends, husbands. We did it ourselves to sort of get a feel, and this helped us improve the data set quite a lot. And after that, so we put that and put, we got some numbers. And then after that, we put the 200 element data set on Amazon Torque and got some annotations. And so I'll show you the task. I was actually tempted to send a copy to FTBOR and ask for some annotations and feedback, but finally we didn't. So here's like for picture true, we show all meaning combinations. It doesn't matter if they make sense or not. We show all four meaning combinations. We explain all the meanings to the user. Then we say, rate the plausibility. Please rate the plausibility of each meaning combination given the following scale. Zero is impossible, seven is extremely likely. And then you've got five other things to work with in the middle. And now here are some example annotations. So for uh, a jog, literally throwing something, a jog throwing a ball, we got that's this is impossible. For a joke throwing a shadow, figuratively throwing something like throwing a shadow, you get extremely likely. Baseball player throwing a ball, uh, sorry, um, joke throwing shadow, very likely. Baseball player throwing a job, extremely likely. That's how it should be. And a baseball thread player, if you look on the internet, you see a lot of examples of this as well. With the shadow of, play, of throwing a shadow, 
is also very likely. In fact, when I did this, I thought we won't get many sixes and the division between low numbers and high numbers is quite a lot, but people were very generous. You quite a, a lot get sixes. And for the normal, normal meaning, you get seven. That's quite interesting. So, okay, a four and a theta square task. At the end, we decided to just show eight phrases at a time. So each task had eight phrases and annotators had 10 minutes per task. It's quite a very generous time allocation. We found one contextual example different from what we had before. So that's for the phrase plant bore, bore plant. So a green plant, pot plant in a pot can bore someone and you change the location of it in your flat. A green plant makes a hole in the carrier bag. You're carrying it with from the shop. A factory boring people with its news or a factory whose job is putting holes in beams. This is very realistic, the last one. And that was our contextual example. Now for the large data set, we had 1,250 annotators. The parameters were the same as before, and uh, it was really nice. We got results very quickly in a matter of days and found 10 contextual examples. So I bet if we left it there for two more days, we would find 20. And so this was the most interesting one was cabinet reflect. So this is a piece of furniture reflecting light or a group of MPs bearing a thought. And um, later Victor showed us how to calculate degree of CBD contextuality. So the average for all these 10 examples was 0 0.18. The highest one uh, was for film admit 0 0.23. And then the second highest was for cabinet reflect 0 0.19. The lowest degree is where for uh, things that had bill in it for some reason, organ bill and port bill. So these were very low contextual examples. Okay, um, now I've, we wanted to sort of get some conceptual conclusions from this study. So, okay, we found some nice contextual examples first. It got us very happy. Then we found more. And now we are sure we can even find more. But so you can ask, so what? Uh, and it turns out that, in fact, you can, if you are patient enough to read through psycholinguistic literature, you can verify some of their claims. Uh, for example, here we uh, looking at the deltas and later on the degree of direct influ influence, we can see that polysomous verbs, not structured polysomous, not homonymous verbs, just polysomous verbs, contribute more to the overall meaning of the phrases than other types of verbs or any other type of uh, polysomous noun. In CBD terms, this is very nice. This means that they have a larger degree of direct influence than other ver uh, verbs or other nouns in the meaning of the phrase, which means we need a smaller context and less time to disambiguate them. Now, uh, when uh, this may sound alien to you, but let's see an example. If I see the phrase board cabinet, you know, this is one of our conditions. I, may, I, th I would think it may mean a speaker board the cabinet members or something punctured a kitchen cabinet. I need very little context to disambiguate. Often just the subject suffices, right? If I see speaker board the cabinet, I know what it means. It's not a speaker making a hole in a furniture, it's a speaker in the parliament. Whereas for contextual examples, like through a picture, this is not the case. We need much more context. If I see a picture through a shadow, Right, the object, which is a shadow, is not enough to help me disambiguate. Often I need an adjective, a prepositional phrase, an adverb, previous or next sentences to decide what this means. A picture through a shadow while running in the field, while holding a ball in a sunny day, and so on and so forth. So that's quite nice. And uh, if you go more fine grained, you can sort of dig more results. I'm not sure if you're interested, but I'll just say one of them polysomous verbs contribute even more to the meaning of the phrase when their subject or object is a polysomous noun rather than a homonymous noun. This is nicely again observed in Bohr picture, which has two possible meanings. And we need a very small context to disambiguate and then compare it with again picture true, which needs more, more than one object. Uh, okay. 
Um, well, okay. Now, um, often these days when you are doing some research, and I, I hope we can write a grant proposal about this together, now that if the world has moved to Europe, it's quite possible. Uh, people at grant agencies ask, what is the impact? And I think here we have a very nice impact case because I, when I was in Primer University, we actually had large labs so equipped with um, tools like this. This is eye track gaze, gaze tracking equipment where people are put to read these ambiguous words and then you track their eye to see how much context they use. Do they go before, after? How much do they move between before and after? Do they not move? It's much cheaper to calculate this equation than to buy many of these devices or just have one and wait for a long time. Um, so that, that's very, if psycholinguists are interested in this, it's important in text comprehension, automatic text understanding, so we can do it easier using mathematics. But also there are some tasks, and this is work in progress now. It's, it's proven more difficult. So this is like, there are tasks that computational linguists are interested to do automatically, such as metaphor identification. So we could try and hypothesize that words with a low degree of direct influence need more context before deciding if they are metaphors or not. Um, and work on metaphor identification using these ideas, which I hope hopefully we'll work on more later. And so, okay. Now I have some kind of philosophy here. So philosophically people can ask, what does contextuality in natural language mean? And I don't have any answers here. Daphne and I, we sit down and we try to sort of philosophize about these things, but we come short of terminology. All we can do is to uh, make analogies with CBD terminology, for example. So in CBD, if you have contextuality, you say, that we cannot have a global joint probability distribution that describes the probabilistic distributions of the systems where we can maximize the probability distribution of each subsystem within the system. So here just change system with phrase. So what does that mean? For example, the single distributions of the meaning of each word within a phrase, noun or verb, subject or object, cannot be used to compute an overall distribution for the meaning combination in those formations. This actually happened to me. If you see the word pitcher in the corpus, mostly as baseball and throw as throwing a ball, when you come across the next occurrence of pitcher two, you cannot be sure that this is a baseball uh, player throwing a ball and not a jog throwing a shadow. So I think that's, at least we can say, this is what it means. You could push it further and use um, terminology from locality and contextuality from quantum mechanics. Uh, to say something about natural language data. For example, contextuality in quantum mechanics says the pre-existing values of any observable is independent of the other observables. And in natural language, you say the pre-existing value of the meaning of a word in a phrase is independent from the meanings of the other ambiguous words in the phrase. For contextual examples, you can say the influences from the context are more crucial than the direct influences of the word and so on and so forth. I wonder if one can do something with these philosophical analogies. Then finally, let me end with talking about signaling a little bit. So we were quite disappointed when we found out that the shift theoretic model only works with strictly no signaling protocols. And so we, we hadn't thought about this signaling property for natural language. So we tried with the help of Victor to say something about it in natural language. So obviously no signaling in quantum mechanics is kind of space-like separation. Uh, ge geographically different locations, which we don't have in natural language. These words occur in the same phrase on the same piece of text. You can imagine tearing a piece of text into two, giving one to an agent, giving the other piece to the other agent. But in general, this can be impossibility of communication and uh, which sometimes does hold in these ambiguous phrases. So if you take the meaning of coach laughs, if you take coach to be the boss, then laugh can only have one of its meaning because bosses don't really drink. But if the meaning of coach is like the sport trainer, laugh can have both of its meanings, running in cycles and drinking. So communication is possible, but not in general. Then, um, so, 
let me, some improvements have been done to the shift theoretic model of contextuality, which I cannot talk about because I think their paper is not online yet, but you can, in fact, uh, we found examples that there's non-signaling possibilistically in the shift theoretic model. So I showed this empirical table, it's a possibilistic empirical table. Again, you can beautifully sort of model the examples we had here. You just code the meanings into the outcomes, zero and one and draw bundle diagrams. We've only found one possibilistically contextual example, but the probabilistic version of it became signaling again. So that didn't work. Now, let me talk about co-reference ambiguities and then I'll come back to the shift theoretic model. Um, so, so I hope you remember this co-reference ambiguities from the beginning of the talk. The man hugged the boy, he was tired. He was crying, he was relieved. I put the CD in the computer, it broke. Now here, my student, Ion, uh, in his master's project last year, he found, um, he set some contextual parameters. You, so you fix three observables, X1, X2, X3, and context. X1 and X2 is a context, X2 and X3 is a context, X1 and X3 is a context, and your outcomes, call them O1 and O2. So this, he found out that this is the minimal scenario for which he can find logically contextual shift theoretic examples. And then he put this in this nice form, linguistically comprehensible form. There is an O1 and an O2. One of them is X1 and the other one is X2. So you can reform this as a co-reference ambiguity. It is X1 and X2, it is X2 and X3. And then you are, you are more specific and you say one is X3 and the other one is X1. And here is a nicer example. There is an apple and a strawberry. It's sweet and round, can be either, we don't know. It's round and red, again, can be either. One is red and the other one is sweet, right? So in the first two, both apple and strawberry can be sweet and round, round and red. But in the last one, we know that if one is red, it's the other one that is sweet. So the observables are the adjectives, sweet, red and round. The contexts are sets of two adjectives together, and the outcomes are obviously this apple and strawberry. Then we found out later that this example is just with adjectives and nouns, but you can absolutely very easily generalize it to adverbs, verbs, prepositional phrases, any grammatical types and nouns. It's very easily generalizable. If you do that, then you get an empirical table, which is logically contextual, uh, and, uh, and so you get this bundle diagram. And then Eon beautifully proves, so we are writing up these results now that the previous contextual scenario, the one that I saw is the minimal one for which you can find strongly logical shift theoretic examples. And the only strongly contextual empirical model on the minimal scenario has this possibilistic table. So th that was a very nice result. So we found uh, contextuality, shift theoretic contextuality in co-reference examples. Um, that was really nice. So then um, we were really eager to also mine probabilities and check probabilistic contextuality, but due to this no signaling property, it wasn't impossible until Shane showed us that he basically gave us two formulae. That, so this allows to determine the degree of contextuality within the signaling fraction of empirical tables. So if, if your models in the lab are erratic, you get some mistakes, measurements aren't sharp, you will get some signaling and you still want to be, answer, uh, to be able to answer if the system is contextual or not. So he showed us a new set of equations to work within the shift theoretic model. So they are writing up this paper. But this enabled us then to go to the probabilistic level, to the corpus level, really natural language data. So we then pick nouns, fruits, different fruits, apple, grape, strawberry, cherry, pets, cat, dog, hamster, rabbit, the people, boy, girl, man, woman. And then we extract, this is very easily doable, extract frequently occurring adjectives or pairs of these nouns from some state of the neural network engine. For example, for fruits, you get rotten, round, sour. For pets, you get sweet, very lovely. For boy and girl, you get things like dead, alive, uh, kind. So, uh, so we found hundreds of shift theoretic examples. And then Eon found 
that you can find you can find them four more times CBD contextual examples. There are apparently CBD contextual examples are much more than shift theoretic examples. And so it's very now nice that they can have both types of contextuality in natural language. It's very nice. So I would like to finish with some open questions. I hope I didn't talk too fast. So uh, I think we can do fun things here. Last time when Daphne gave her talk, there was somebody in the audience who was Polish and asked about contextuality in different languages. And I believe there can be languages like my mother tongue for C is extremely ambiguous. And I think this is one of the reasons that all these international negotiations with Iran fail. The language is inherently ambiguous. So we can talk which language is most ambiguous by talking by like finding more contextual examples in that language. I'm joking to, to a large extent, but I think this would be interesting in an international setting. Then we haven't yet cracked how to deal with grammatical type ambiguities, which I showed at the beginning, they are very common. We don't know how to model this in CBD or shift theoretic examples. Then I would, this is my uh, personal quest to formally connecting neural neural network contextual embeddings to quantum and quantum-like contextuality formal notions. There should be a way of going back and forth between the two. And then we got more ambitious and we tried to sort of also find rank four phrases, phrases that are in this connection with each other. You've got a verb, which has a subject, another verb, it has the same object and we have a noun that shares an object and a subject relationship with the two verbs. And although, so our large scale data set had 400 of rank four phrases, but we didn't find any contextual examples. And I was wondering if there is a connection between uh, degree of contextuality and the rank of a system. And finally, there is this very nice challenge in uh, computational linguistics, the Vinograd schema challenge. These come from co-reference ambiguities, like the first sentence of this uh, data set is police denied demonstrators permit since they feared violence. So this is the police fearing violence. But if you say police denied demonstrators permit since they advocated violence, this is the demonstrators advocating violence. There are many other examples. The fish ate warm, it was hungry. This is the fish being hungry. Fish ate warm, it was tasty. I thought quantum contextuality could be checked in these examples, but Eon very quickly said that these are deterministic for human beings. Machines can't decide. But for humans, there's no contextuality here, right? I mean, there's no choice. So he then generalized the Vinograd to the following form. For example, you say, John helped or was helped by Ken with his homework. His can refer to either John or Ken. He is grateful for either the help or the opportunity. So help, help by the help and the opportunity to help are your context there. And you get kind of a bell-like contextuality if it works. Now we are busy trying to put this online and get some um, data for it. So to check it, so this is obviously possibilistically um, contextual, but we're trying to sort of see how can we mine probabilities to make it probabilistically uh, contextual as well. And then maybe then we can find a way of using quantum contextuality in solving generalized Vinograd schema challenge. Thank you.